Hey there, North South Connection Podcast Network. Welcome to the latest edition of the Multiverse of Fabulousness, where things are always so fabulous. I don't know why I did a Johnny B. Bad thing there. That was sort of Johnny B. Bad, sort of Steven Tyler from the beginning of the video game Revolution X, where he goes, Revolution X! My God, what a fucking... <laughs> What a what a what a uh, reference to use there! I well, love you it. Play, you played that game right, where it's like music is the weapon. Yeah, this is this is gonna get us kicked off of YouTube. Me doing, I'm just doing Batista's thing. Yeah, do Batista style. Yeah. Anywho, uh, I'm Johnny C. This is Keithy Langston. Keithy, how are hey, you? I'm good. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm available I, in both audio and visual. I miss in case you. Anyone's wondering? Oh, I miss you too. The um. <laughs> You know, I've been up to my ears in Cronoso and new mm. TNN stuff that mm. we just haven't been fabulous together in like a month. That's okay. But when we get together, it's always fabulous. It is. It is. It's always fabulous. And, uh, you know, it's kind of cool that we're on this like digital phone call that's going to be on the Internet, because nowadays sure. you just can't you can do more than make digital phone calls with your friends. You can yeah. actually play video games. Sure. You can play Mortal Kombat with a friend in Vietnam. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> oh my god that's wow did that take me back oh my god you're not supposed to laugh at your own jokes but that just really that hit is, me like i can i can seriously. see him doing it yeah you know? that's fantastic wow what a reference to what was that mid 90s 1996 <laughs> late, 90, late 90s yeah yeah good lord so it was kind of it's kind of crazy uh, i remember going to the theater and the cable guy was an option but i saw phenomenon instead because independence day was sold out mm. and my parents went to see script tease so those four movies were all at the box office the same week wow i've seen all four of them not all in the theater but uh no i think cable guy did i go see cable guy in the theater probably i was a big jim carrey fan Sure. Him getting birth from a uh, from a rhinoceros in Ace Ventura 2 is probably like one of the greatest scenes in comedic history, as far as I'm concerned. Can we just, I promise this is a wrestling show, people, but can we just pause and talk about the steep drop-off and decline in quality between Ace Ventura and Ace Ventura when nature calls? Come on. I mean, yes, but Ace Ventura when nature calls gives us the best line ever, which is, can I hunt these rhinos? <laughs> And in fact, I often I often say that kids these days don't know how hot it is in these rhinos. <laughs> you know uh, whose favorite scene that is? Who's yours? Uh, Stu. <laughs> Irenu. <laughs> Look at that guy coming out of the. Yeah, he's, 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 I went out there and I flipped. I was flipping the uh, eggs and then I flipped the turd out of the uh, cat box and then I flipped the eggs again. So the multiverse of fact, Matthew, I got yeah, where are we going this week? All right. So, you know, we do we do pop culture variants this time. The multiverse has opened up and uh, we're going to go to Earth Smash. Ooh. Now, you might think we're both smashed because we're talking about Ace Ventura. But my Mortal Kombat with a friend in Vietnam was actually going to what the my fucking segue to the fact that um a lot of people play the video game Super Smash Brothers. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with what Super Smash Brothers is, really quick, um, it's basically Nintendo's multiplayer party. I don't want to call it a party fighting game because it is very, there is a very hardcore competitive scene that I don't want to alienate. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be a party game where four people, I think, can play online on the GameCube anyway. But my point is this. Uh, the roster of fighters you use in this fighting game is made up of a who's who's of Nintendo's intellectual properties and other game characters they invite. For example, mm. Keith, would I find a couple of plumbers from Brooklyn in this game? Quite possibly, yes. Okay, would I find maybe their dinosaur friend? Absolutely. So you see where we're going here. You got Princess Zelda, Link, Mario, Donkey Kong, all those people like uh, Samus from Metroid. The mm -hmm. point is, is that it's all... Nintendo characters, mm. and then there's some others, but we'll just forget about that. So imagine a world where instead of Super Smash Brothers being the video game phenomenon that it is, Super Entertainment Brothers <laughs> is the video game phenomenon that we wow. are here to discuss today. Now, okay. you got to imagine, if there was a WWE-based Smash game, okay, mm -hmm. um, they would absolutely mine their intellectual properties to create a roster of characters unlike any other. Austin with Hogan, with Rock, with Flair, sure. with Asuka, with Becky Lynch, with uh, Moolah. You know what I'm saying? 
Mm -hmm. It's because there's so many characters available. That's the whole fun. However, Keith, on this Earth, it appears they're about to release an eight pack of downloadable characters. Wow. Okay. And we have really reached the bottom of the barrel because everybody who's ever meant anything to the World Wrestling Federation Mm. is already a selectable character. So it's Keith and I's responsibility to give us to give you our picks for the eight downloadable characters that you could purchase for a premium price. Yeah. So is that about sum it up? I think so. Sounds like it. And um, I believe I found eight very obscure characters. So yes. I'd love to see if we're going to have any synergy between you and I. I'm really curious if we have any synergy. <laughs> like I would, I would flip my lid if we have synergy. So the, All right. criteria, the criteria that we basically put out there is pretty straightforward. Hold on. I need to turn my microphone volume down because I can hear myself breathing. <laughs> All right, that's better. So we each selected eight characters. Mm -hmm. And the only real criteria is that at some point in time, they had to have been on WWF or ETV or basically just some sort of television product that that the WWF slash E now owns. Okay? Because once they own you, you're their property. These people don't have rights. That's right. Okay? And we're going to give you a little bit of backstory as to why they chose to enter the tournament, that being these characters, and then just give you a special move. And then stay tuned to the very end, because while this game doesn't actually exist, Keith and I might have a way to bring it to life for your visual and audio entertainment. Now, Keith, I I, got to tell you, I've been talking for like 20 minutes. I'd like you to go first, if you would. Sure. So the first character I found uh, was Frenchie Martin. Mm. So, Frenchie Martin, um, a member of the Parti Québécois, Frenchie Martin has been a flag-waving totalitarian member of the party for Quebec independence, and he has now brought his soapbox to Super Entertainment Brothers. He fights for freedom using drop kicks and deep arm drags, and he finishes off his opponents with their Liberty crossface, which is just a variation of the LaBelle lock while using the fleur de lis flag to increase the pressure on his opponent. Oh, absolutely. That fleur de lis is, is, a, is a deadly weapon. Okay. So that's Frenchie Martin. You can tell, and I don't want to speak for you, but I know that we both do it, that we've been uh, ass deep in the Cronoso project because we've been seeing a lot of Frenchie Martin lately, we sh- we sure which is have. not a bad thing, but man, it's, you know, Frenchie Martins and Dino Bravos and mm-hmm. one man gangs. I'm ready for the new crop of WWF superstars on Cronoso. <laughs> one man gang. Yeah, that's one, right. One man gang. Well, the the one man gang is about to go through a little bit of a transition, but I love the I love the pick of Frenchie Martin because mm. those who know know, mm. and those who don't don't. Mm. And you know, like um, you know, if my kid was playing this game, he'd be like, uh, "Who's Frenchie Martin?" And it's not because he's not educated, because the kid knows his shit. But Frenchie Martin is a deep pull that mm-hmm. doesn't have a lot of impact in the WWE or WWF. And that's why I like it as a pick, because it's completely unnecessary, and they're not going to make a dime off of it. And that's kind of what we I, you know, I was kind of going for that. Sure. Um, do you have a favorite Frenchie Martin moment? Like, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but, like, I mean, I don't... <sighs> You know, I can't really pull one out of my ass except that one time he looked like this. I mean, I think it's got to be just every time he got on the microphone and just graveled, gravelly voiced his way through a promo where he was spewing out like half French, half English, like, and yeah. I've used this joke on a podcast before, but it might not have been on No So, so I'm going for it. Dude looks like Bernie Lomax, Mm. but Bernie Lomax from Mannequin 2 when he plays the evil Duke. We actually call him uh, Frenchie Kaiser, which is his name's Harry Kaiser. Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. He, no, he's absolutely Bernie. Mo- it's amazing because that's what Pete and I on GFA Live do all the time. As we go, here comes Frenchie Kaiser. So Fuck, yeah, did I steal that joke from you? Um, I mean, if you did, that's f- perfectly fine. But I mean, if you've always thought he looked like Bernie Lomax, uh, I wouldn't fault you. The man looks like Bernie Lomax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Famous victim of Jason Voorhees. There needs to be a, you know, I feel like we've talked about Terry Kaiser. There needs to be like a Terry Kaiser cinematic. I love, wait, I love though that you said he looks like Terry. He looks like Bernie Lomax from, from, uh, 
mannequin too because that's exactly what we compared him to <laughs> the duke or the count it, it's so it's so amazing oh god the synergy amongst the two of us is just incredible it's pity that uh he, has he ever been the real question is has he ever been in a movie with arnold Wuslu or sven Oli Thorsen? <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that they've crossed paths at once or in one point or another i'm sure of it oh, probably it. sven he's probably been in a movie with sven Sure. I would say that's definitely a possibility, so we'll have to check it out. I don't know. That shit just cracks me up. All right. Well, to keep things trucking along and to represent Snake, I will do my next two. Yes. All right. So um, have you played Smash? Yeah, of course I have. One of my favorite uh, characters is the Ice Climber. Mm. Now, what I like about the Ice Climber is that it's a little blue person in a parka and a little mm-hmm. pink person red person in a parka mm-hmm. but they're kind of a tag team they exist in tandem mm-hmm. i took a little bit from them for my first pick ladies and gentlemen wwf super fans of the new generation george and adam george. now <laughs> that's a deep cut <laughs> george and adam um oh. have been getting a lot of play on um the re- the rosling war zone by mm-hmm. jt and chad and it really makes me like their hatred for George and Adam has has really broken my heart. So I'm bringing mm-hmm. them back back into the pop culture zeitgeist in a positive way. So their 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 storyline is that after being forcibly removed from the 1997 <laughs> Royal Rumble, uh, George and Adam dedicated themselves to honing the craft of professional wrestling and sharpening their bodies to the peak of the human condition. Wow. And after after one week in a wrestling school that was owned by the insane clown posse, uh, those plans fell apart. And so they remained out of shape and losers. They have entered the Super Entertainment Brothers Tournament in hopes of proving to Vincent Kennedy McMahon that they deserved to not only watch the 1997 Royal Rumble, but they should have had ringside seats. Oof. I am sold. And now, does this a, count as two and three or one and two for you? It No, this counts as one because the ice okay. climbers are linked, but this is the only one I have like that. Okay. It was a cheat, and that's why I brought up the ice climber specifically. Okay. It's funny because and I'll and I'll tell you once I do my next one I'll explain why I ask. So go ahead. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, their special move is the five dollar ticket. Now Keithy, Keithy gave us a wrestling maneuver, which was a finish. Uh, I'm thinking more of like a special move, like you know Mario throws a fireball. Okay, sure. but but mm-hmm. that's cool too. I love the the uh, the five dollar ticket. They throw a five dollar Taco Bell stamped 1997 Royal Rumble ticket that dazes sure. the opponent for a few seconds if it connects. Of course, those tickets famously on sale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. All right, so I'll go ahead and go with number two, which is more uh, in ring based. My number two choice is specifically called WWF Champion Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase. <laughs> so. For those who don't know, and you should, because it's the greatest television program in professional wrestling period, on the 1988 main event, uh, um, Mm. Ted DiBiase was the champ, hypothetically, in quotation marks. But he had the belt around his waist, and the iconic picture of him holding the belt in that suit Mm. is is amazing. Absolutely. As is the one, is it in Boston, where Mm. he has the belt at a house show? Have you seen this picture? Yeah, he defends it, yeah. All right, so he was the champ. Uh, and he wore the gold probably outside his awesome Million Dollar Man suits. Now, this iconic look was immortalized in the main event. Um, the sheer amount of awesome energy that was mm. unleashed mm. by this belt-wearing heel caused a ripped in the multiverse where an exact copy of the belt-wearing Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase remained in stasis. Okay. Until the energy from the Super Entertainment Brothers tournament broke him loose, and now he's here to join the tournament. He's seeking vengeance. For the controversial ruling of former World Wrestling Federation president Jack Tunney, uh, who I don't think he knows is dead yet. It's almost like he's broken out of the negative zone, like, uh, like, uh, oh god, I'm gonna, you're gonna kill me. Annihilus. No, who's the uh, not the negative zone? Oh, uh, what's the one that um, Superman's zone. villains? The Phantom Zone. Yeah, you General know the Zod. glass, the General Zod, but the Zod from Superman and uh, Superman Terrence too. Stan. Yeah, where it's like the glass, pane of glass, he breaks out of that stasis. Hey, you know I how apologize you... for I apologize for mixing up negative zone and phantom zone, but you understood what I was uh, coming you're good. from. You know how you had a um, a hot weekend the other day going to see SummerSlam with lots of people? Sure. Um I had a hot, awesome weekend the other <laughs> weekend watching Superman two and then watching Superman two, the Richard Donner cut. Ooh, okay. That's see, my I, life. I mean, 
I need to watch the Donner cut because I know the Donner cut is so much better, right? Um, so I grew up watching the second one. This is not cut sure. and dry. This is not cut and dry where it's like Justice League versus Zack Snyder's Justice yeah, League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, I, I, I grew up watching the non-Donner cut. Yeah. I still don't understand. Like, there's there's still some Richard Lester stuff. And there's an amazing sequence where um, Lois finds out Clark is Superman. But here's the caveat. None of it was actually filmed on location. It's Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder's multiple screen tests edited together. Oh, wow. And they changed their appearance in between shot. Like at one point, Christopher Reeve is standing up and he has his hair done a certain way and he's wearing a certain jacket. And I know that makes it sound bad, but Keith, I'm telling you. It fits together very nicely. It, the emotion that they were able to pull in a screen test. Yeah. I think it's worth it just to see it. It's a okay. spectacle. All right. It's a spectacle. Nice. Um, it's his finishing move is the Virgil toss. Uh, World Wrestling Federation champion Miller Man Teddy Biasi has Hammer Space. Mm. Now, Hammer Space, of course, from across the Spider Verse or everything. Like, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it had an official name until. Did you see Across the Spider Verse? Yeah. Okay, where it's like Hammer Space. Yeah. Uh, where he has an unlimited supply of Virgils that he can toss without care, like Hulk Hogan did at WrestleMania Four. I love it. I love it. Oh, fuck, I should have done Earl Hebner toss because it's the champ. I'm changing it. He has an unlimited amount of Earl Hebners that he can toss. Earl Hebner toss would be better because Earl Hebner's smaller than Virgil. But and I it like plays it still. off the plastic surgery angle, dude. But you could also have it where every once in a while the it glitches and he throws a Virgil as well. Sure. <laughs> and that and the kicker, I mean, the, and the, he's always wearing his his the championship belt in his shirt. Sure. Team. Absolutely. Like it's specifically mm-hmm. that one. Mm-hmm. So. All right, you are up for your two and three. All righty. So my number two is Vivian of the Rosati sisters. Whoa, I want to let you know I have no idea who this is, and I'm so happy. Oh, my God. Okay, so for a brief period, I'll give you a quick background on the actual Rosati sisters. So for a while, uh, during the heyday of primetime wrestling when Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon were hosting, there was these, there was these, this group of super fans of heavyset women who were called the Rosati sisters. And they were friends actually in real life of Vince McMahon. And they were just super fans and they would come from time to time on primetime, kind of like how Jameson would show up every once in a while. The Rosati sisters would show up once in a while. However, in June, I believe June or July of 89, when Bobby Heenan was thrown off of primetime and, 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 uh, because he got into an argument with Roddy Piper and he created the Bobby Heenan show, which was the last hour of primetime for three weeks. And I believe it was June, July of 89. He had it like, they were like his, Almost his Ed McMahon to his Johnny Carson, the Rosati sisters. Uh, real life Vivian of the Rosati sisters. Uh, she did pass away, but uh, she was a super fan and they interviewed her. And I read the interview on the research on this and I found her in the multiverse. So when one thinks of prime time, one can only imagine one name. Rosati. The Rosati sisters were a staple of primetime wrestling, and Vivian continues that tradition of knockdown, gra- drag out competitiveness. Vivian uses her girth and strength to overpower her opponents with splashes and elbow drops. She maneuvers around the ring as graceful as a ballet dancer, but only to toss her weight onto an unsuspecting Joe. Her finishing maneuver is reminiscent of her favorite manager, Bobby the Brain Heenan, where she removes a weasel from her crotch and throws it to and, uh, and allows it to claw out the eyes at one who dares to enter her arena. That is tremendous. <laughs> like, I first of all, like I had to mute myself. I was about to fucking laugh. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like so. I don't know, like. I'm so happy to have learned about this little piece of history that I had no idea about. And you said it's between June and July, 89 well, they, with the Heenan you, if, show. Yeah. Like if you go on and look at the, if you look at the June, July episodes of primetime, look for like the, actually, if you just Google the Bobby Heenan show, it'll show up. Cause it was only like three episodes. And then, well, and then, okay. they, cause they tried something different. They tried to basically do kind of like what uh, TNT was, but for Bobby Heenan, but it didn't work because Bobby needed Gorilla and vice versa to make the comedy work. But, oh, so it's yeah. not funny? It's not worth a watch? Oh, no, no, no. It's worth a watch. It's just, okay. it's, it's, oh, no, it's fantastic. It Those episodes of primetime with the Bobby Heenan show at the end are fantastic. But well, uh, the Rosati sisters showed up a lot more during primetime and Bobby Heenan would always make references to them and stuff to them. So it was kind of like they were his, almost like his 
his fodder as he liked you know he he would he would goof on them but they i guess they were friends they were like longtime friends of like the mcmahons and things like that so but they're all heavy set women and <laughs> it's obviously they goof on them for being heavy but... my my fandom started in november 89 so it makes perfect sense to me sure. why i have this blind spot but i still oh, yeah. don't i still don't like having it though yeah no you can check it out yeah rosati r-o-s-a-t-i <laughs> ROS. I feel all like right. I feel like Scott and JT would talk about them on a uh, place to be all the time, and oh, I just thought yeah. they were talking about two ladies they knew. Yeah, no, they're probably probably talking about them. Yeah. Um, um number three. All right. <clears throat> the genius. Look out below! Here comes your dangerous foe. The genius is ready for action. He stalks his opponent, waiting to unleash his plight, and only attacks when the moment is right. The genius uses his intellect superior, and he finds all others severely inferior. Do not fret. Do not frown. The genius is known for taking you down. And when all else fails, he always wins the day. When he hits you with his metal scroll, your fans will need to pray. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just just, just the kiss, you know, <laughs> the kiss of the chef, because I, I love I love it. And your Lanny Papa is really good. Too. Oh, I've been honing it, but it's usually because I'm talking about his his well known ability to do something that uh, self healing. Yeah, not not many people can. Yeah, his, his self healing. <laughs> That's even better. We can we use that in the game? Can he self heal that way in the game? <laughs> Absolutely. I don't because know because you've got to be able to have potions and shit. Well, not well in the game. You, there there is a power up that heals you. Mm, okay, well, that's a very interesting power up if uh, Lanny is able to do that for himself. But well, Keith, this this, no. this entertainment based software is rated M for mature. Hickory dickory dock, as we like to say over on GFA Live. Um, yeah, no, I we've been working on the I've been working on the genius for many years now. <laughs> he, um, I remember my first WWF, and this is not like a walk down Johnny C's history, but one of my favorite genius moments is my first WWF magazine turning the pages to see him in perfect smashing the, the winged eagle title belt and me being like, what the hell is this? Because I never saw it because the magazines were covering it stuff was, that happened three months ago. It was it was awesome. That was an awesome scene. I mean, I was never a Hogan fan ever anyway. So, no, I never liked Hogan. I know it's shocking. I understand. I'm a heel guy. I love heels. Heels are way more interesting. Okay, what about Hollywood Hogan? Uh, by that point, I had already known how much of the uh, BSing Hogan had done in the backstage. So it was like, you know, if anything, Hollywood Hogan was just his real persona coming out. But uh, needless to say, uh, one of my favorite moments of was that smashing of the title because I really, I, for some reason, I really wanted perfect to win the championship i really wanted a mr perfect reign and um shout out to my tag team partner on my uh, on the other show pd because pd wanted to have like an 11 year reign of the genius being champion like he really did like he wanted the genius to win the title in 89 and hold it all the way up to like 2000 like he really did so and i support that <laughs> there's definitely some I get, I, it's probably because he, he recently passed. Uh, yes. I get so many like Pee Wee Herman vibes from the genius. Oh, sure. Um, I just rewatched that movie for the first time in my adult life. It's tremendous. Uh, but, but the genius, it's such a good character that I feel like could have generated heat for some time. Um, oh, yeah. And he did. I mean, oddly enough, you know, that there, I looked this up the other day. I was really curious. Do you know that there's only... I believe there's only one match where the genius wrestles Randy Savage. Really? Yeah. I mean, I think they were they were involved in like I think battle royals and stuff like that, but I think there's only one one on one match. Well, he's wasted with with acts like the Beverly Brothers and shit sure. like that. Like, why not? I don't know. Like, well, he wasn't. Was well, when he was leaping Lanny Poffo, he was this, he was essentially a jobber to the stars. He was an enhancement guy, and. When they paired him up with Perfect, it was it was literally perfect because it was just great to have him as that. Even though even though Henne didn't need a mouthpiece, it was good for him to have that bit. And then it was great because like as soon as they rolled Hogan off of Savage, they rolled him on to like Henning and Perfect. I mean Henning and Genius and Lanny's friggin' Savage's brother. It's awesome. So it's like, and I believe. <laughs> Lanny Poffo has something that Savage doesn't have, which is a televised win over Hulk Hogan. <laughs> wow. Randy that's, never got it. Randy never got the televised win. Unless you so count true. like the Nesson and the Spectrum and the Yes Network 
you know, the, from all the house shows. But uh, no, Henning, I mean, Genius has that count of victory over Hogan. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else on the Genius? Oh, uh, uh, did you give us finish? He hits the guys with the metal scroll. That's right. So, so kind of like yours, he throws the metal scroll at somebody. Right. That's right. his special. That's his okay. special power. What should he say? Because you know you've got the iconic like Scorpion. Get over here. You know. Oh, I think he says Hickory Dickory Dock. Every time, I love it. It's fucking perfect. Hey, perfect. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> that was a good one. Yes. Okay. So, anywho, um, number three for me. That rhyme. Uh, Reed Flair. Oh God. Now hold on. Just I, I and I do I do think this warrants. Oof. This is this is meant out of like love, an honest to goodness love place. Mm-hmm. And if you don't believe me, check out WCW Must Die on the new TNN, formerly sure. on this network. And that's not a that's not a plug. Anywho, uh, in the summer of the year 2000, North Carolina AAU wrestling champion Reed Fleer mm. turned pro when he joined the ranks of WCW. He took the ring name Reed Flair. And was known for feuding with WCW head writer Vince Russo until Reed Flair disappeared the night after the Great American Bash 2000. Now, Reed has chosen to enter the Super Entertainment Brothers tournament mm-hmm. in hopes of recouping some of the funds that he is owed from his tenure as a WCW superstar, as the organization never paid him because <laughs> he was a minor at the time, despite <laughs> the fact that this kid legitimately had uh... more time than hard knocks Chris Candido. Mm-hmm. Now, his special move is the collar pop, shoot the leg. Now, Reed would pop the collar on his Abercrombie shirt. Okay? And he shoots the double leg takedown. Now, this oh, not only does damage to the opponent, but it also makes all of Reed's friends at home jealous, as not only is Reed an active combatant in the wars of sports-based entertainment, but his dad bought him this sweet, cool shirt that the other kids can't afford. The kid wears the fucking same shirt on every episode of WCW year 2000. Um, and and he's but I'll tell you what, though, the kid's got TV time. And I, I, I want to know, did he ever get paid? I'm putting you on the spot, Keith. What do you think happened? I don't know if you've ever seen these shows sure. or if you have an idea of Reed Flair, because mm-hmm. they call him Reed Flair. Mm-hmm. They don't call him Reed Fleer. They call Beth Beth Fleer. And Megan Fleer and Ashley Fleer. But Reed is a flair like David. He's a real fucking character. Huh. So did he get paid? I don't think he ever got paid. So does Rick, does Rick and Beth get paid because he's their child? I don't even know if Rick got paid for this. Well, I, feel, I feel like nobody got paid those last few years. No, everybody got paid. I think everybody got paid because that was one thing WCW was good at is making sure they overpaid their talent for uh, – you know, wasting everybody's time, basically. So, and, yes. But my And my quip about him having more TV time than Chris Candido does accomplish two things. Number one, it tells the truth. It also makes fun of Chris Candido, which I like to do. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, don't, I don't know. He just has all this time, and, and it's entertaining yeah. sometimes. Oh, he's got so, tons of TV time. He was on yeah. all the time. All right. Made his way to WWF television, too. WWE, excuse me, television, I believe. Yeah. yeah During that that's, eight, that's WrestleMania true. 18 time where I think The Undertaker beat – doesn't The Undertaker beat him up in a bathroom? That's David. Oh, that's David? Oh, excuse me. But Reed Flair appears at WrestleMania 24 in the front row. <laughs> All right. So um, <laughs> check out that Great American Bash 2000. He appears where, in the front row. <laughs> where Charlotte uh, gets involved physically with Vince Russo. Mm. Number four for me is Doctor with a question mark. Because Dr. Mario is a character in Smash Brothers. Dr. Francois Petit. Ah, I thought you were going to go with, I thought you were going with some other person who had been known to be called doctor. This doctor, this doctor right here. That's, oh, no, yeah, not that. Doctor Not Z. that doctor. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Dr. Harvey Whippleman. Oh, for sure. Yes. So this dude is best known for saving the life of Mick Foley during the 1998 King of the Ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's also known for a sweet French accent that sometimes got on TV. Now, mm-hmm. Francois is ready to prove his worth to the athletes that he once massaged. Uh-huh. So, using his mastery of the martial arts and uh, coming across an old glacier outfit in the WWE headquarters, uh, Dr. Francois Petit takes this glacier uniform, puts it on, and enters the Super Entertainment Brothers tournament to prove his worth. Now, <laughs> Francois Petit, if you don't know who the fuck we're talking about, can best be seen in the Hell in a Cell match between Mick Foley and Taker. He's got the ponytail, and he's like, Mick. Mick talks about him a lot in his book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
this character was getting in because he's random, Keith. But do you want to know what I learned about this motherfucker? What? And this, I might not be covering new ground here, but I didn't know this. And the fact that I didn't know this makes my brain hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Francois Petit, not yeah. only was that, yeah, was that guy yeah. on TV that worked for Vince, but he also played Sub-Zero in 1995's Mortal Kombat. Wow. Yeah, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. So there's, even more, there's even more synergy because this is kind of like the, uh, I guess we could say the spiritual successor of Mortal Kombat. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And... Um, it just blows my mind that this guy was that guy. So in uh, honor of that, his special move is the ice grenade. He uh, pulls out some leftover props and mm -hmm. throws ice grenades at you and freezes you. I love it. So, But I, I was it. just fucking blown away. Now, I, I use that because it's a random person. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about using... Well, I don't know if you use this guy. I don't want to say his name just in case you used him. I'm sure I haven't. Who? The um, WWF security guy that's still there. I did there. not use it. Yeah, I okay. did not use him. Okay, but what's yeah. that guy's name? Oh, uh, I knew it's, his... I knew, it's, well, it's, it's not Jim Johnson, because that's the musician, but it's kind of dangerously close to that, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, I forget his name. Yeah. I yeah. I forget his name. Do you want me to look it up real quick or no? No. Okay. Let them I... at home look it up. Uh, but you guys know who we're talking about, though. He's a big what bruiser the... with the fucking... Let them at home look it up. <laughs> With the Kangle guy. No, I yeah, feel bad. Yeah. You can look it up if you want, but that's totally up to you. So that that's the end of me for three and four. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so my next guy is the Blacktop Bully. Looking to smash his opponents into the ground, the Blacktop Bully is a violent cross-country long-haul truck driver. Bully has been known to strike fear in a truck stops across Route 66 and never backs down from a fight. He once beat Red Barclay in the Slaughterhouse 16-pound sirloin -a lot contest, but he could not best Tony Randall in the main event. When the king of the road comes calling, you better answer, or he will come at you with his, demo his demolishing death drop off the bumper of his Big Mac truck. Horn blast. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love that match. <laughs> the King of the Road match is spectacular. Did you get my Red Barclay reference, though? No, I did uh, not. It totally went over my head. It's from The Simpsons. It's when Homer Homer goes to, they go to, like, the, uh, they go to the steakhouse, the slaughterhouse, and Homer wants to eat the 16-pound sirloin a lot, and the only other person that's ever eaten it besides this guy who's, like, a truck driver, his name is Red Barclay, and the other guy is Tony Randall. <laughs> ah, sorry, shit. But... That, I figured you'd get that, but that's all right. Uh, no, I, I don't think somebody I... out there. Somebody out there is going, ah, Tony Randall. Somebody out there is, I hope. Uh, yeah, there they are. They exist. They exist out there. Mm -hmm. Now, I am a little disappointed. Oh, Not really I, disappointed. Because I use the WCW guy. <laughs> no, because um, I'm kind of more in love. Yeah, I love the King of the Road match, but um, what is Barry Darso's golf character? Oh, hole in one Darso. Hole in one Darso. Because the other day I was I wa I fell into a black hole of <laughs> hole in one Darso Saturday night matches. I love hole in Darso. I love hole in one. I mean, I love them all. I mean, I could do hole in one Darso for days, but I I wanted to go with um, I wanted to go with the black top bully because <laughs> mostly because I wanted to get the uh, <laughs> the reference to Red Barkley in there. <laughs> That I totally whiffed on. That's I feel, right. Don't worry about it. It happens. It's I okay. feel I feel like a disappointment. Nah, I don't be it. You're not a disappointment. You're perfectly fine. But yeah, you like the you like the hole in one Darso. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I I didn't really experience it much. I was looking for something stupid to talk about on a show, and I love that he lets he he does the like hole in, he does the putting challenge before the match and the oh, mm -hmm. the, the showmanship involved with what mm -hmm. he's doing and the mm -hmm. fact that it's all at like the. Uh, Walt Disney MGM studio soundstage. Yeah. Like there's something really fun there. He, he was trying. He really was. You got to give a guy, you got to give a guy like Darso credit. He was trying his damnedest to get over. And, uh, I don't know. I feel like maybe he did. I don't know. In my opinion, he did. No. Well, the thing is, is that there's, there's over in terms of like finance and, and viewers and ratings and what have you. And then there's like doing the craft well. Sure. And I know that one pays better than the other. Uh, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I I like seeing people 
perfect their craft. Absolutely. You know, and uh, you know, he it's like a it's like a character actor. Like uh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say Arnold Vluce Vluce is a character actor, but um, you but know, Sven Olsen definitely is. But you know, pick your favorite character actor, and yes. and that's what guys like Darso are. Yeah. So I like I like the fact he's gonna get some. Is he still alive? Yeah, Darso's still alive. Okay. Absolutely. He's gonna get paid from these downloads. Sure. So you're getting him in. I like I, it. Absolutely. Do, both him and uh, Bill Eady of Demolition, they're still alive. So is nice. uh, uh, the Warlord and Barbarian are still alive. There was actually this awesome picture of it was it was the it was Powers of Pain, Demolition, I think the Rock and Roll Express, and well, it wasn't the Midnight's because. Bobby Eaton's gone. Um, there was another tag team. I can't remember what the other tag team was, but it was all people who who the Road Warriors have fought. <laughs> and I was like, and I tweeted out, I was like, huh, look who's all still alive. Hmm, what's the fact? Like, what's the common denominator here? Oh yeah, yeah. the two dead guys fought them all. <laughs> so right. yeah, but uh, no, I uh, yeah, I. I, I I'm not a I'm not a fan, I, and I, this this goes against a lot of uh, people have given me looks. Uh, Scott Criscolo actually gave me a death stare when I said this at uh, when I was in Detroit for the SummerSlam, but I said I was not a fan of the Road Warriors, and uh, he mm-hmm. just kind of gave me a really dirty look. But I defend that to the I'll defend that to the death. So, but moving on, number five, it's the one and only John Laurinaitis. <laughs> Oh coming, down, coming down the ramp in his people power scooter is America's most hated villain, Johnny Ace. <laughs> Every company needs an asshole, and Johnny Ace is that man. He'll sign, he signs the wrong one-legged man. He only picks divas who are hot models. And don't worry, he'll marry your mother. He's the world's biggest prick. And if you don't ask, if you don't believe us, ask Jim Cornette. He'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Johnny Ace will wave the New Zealand flag and hit you with his skateboard, but not before he bores you to death with his contract renegotiations. <laughs> Check out Johnny Ace, John Laurinaitis. It's so weird that Laurinaitis became like an on-screen character, um, because like for the longest time he was like a real person. He was a real person, a real piece of shit. It'd be like if to- it'd be. Uh, and I'm not comparing the two. Um, oh God, what is? I almost said Tony Khan. What is? Nick Khan. Nick Khan. Yeah, it's like yeah. if Nick Khan became a character. Yeah. Oh, believe you know, Vince had his way. Nick Khan would be an on-screen character like tomorrow. Trust me. <laughs> I mean, gotta have another uh, person, guy. <laughs> it's so weird. I know a lot of people. Okay, and I'm not trying to take this over, but I think the Laurinaitis conversation leads to this because we're talking about it now. Absolutely. Um, and you were just at SummerSlam. How does the matches sponsored by go over in a large crowd? Does it even matter? I mean, I think the one at the Rumble. What was that? The uh, Mountain Dew Black Knight or whatever. Okay, the... that that's the. Yeah, that's a bad example. I'm talking well, that, about. But that's a bad example of right. what happened. That was a sponsor. I think was it Mania that had the um, the Rey Mysterio match. Yes, sponsored it by it? whatever it was. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Yeah, that was See? weird. I remember though. No, that's good, but that was weird because for me, that's like a blood feud match. You don't put a blood feud match as the match that's being sponsored by a kid cereal, you know? Could, could I um, could I disagree with you for a moment, but in an, uh, what I feel is an intelligent way? Sure, absolutely. If it were a thing, wouldn't you want to be one of the sponsored matches regardless? If it were a thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. I think that as far as the sponsorship, I think that they were probably saying any chance you can to get us on the card would be great. But I think just for me, I feel like having a sponsorship in a match that's like a blood feud is kind of weird. So for this pay-per-view or premium live event, excuse me, um, Slim Jim, which I guess Slim Jim is going to be sponsoring like a ton of matches moving forward. Slim Jim had it was like the Slim Jim Battle Royal or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was perfect. That was perfectly acceptable. Like if you want my opinion, I feel like they and they do have L.A. Knight in one of the Slim Jim commercials now. So that works. But like. I would think that you can use it as an opportunity to, pr- to promote the product by saying whoever wins the battle Royal is going to be the new Slim Jim sponsor. 
it, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the case, but like, that's a huge thing to say, like whoever wins the battle Royal, or whoever wins the King of the ring or whoever wins that, like you're going to become now the new spokesman for slim Jim or the new spokesman for Gatorade or the new spokesman for Mountain Dew black pitch black, whatever it is. And I think that that's fine. Um, it's not, they wouldn't be the first sport to do it. You know, I mean, other sports do, I mean, Jesus, look at, Every other like look at NASCAR and soccer and you know all those guys are covered in constantly in all different advertisements. So and, I don't and that's, agree with it. And that's exactly the thing. I feel like it it adds a level of legitimacy to it. Sure. And what's interesting is that these these companies, you know, they they recognize. You know, it's not like back in the day where you had to, like Ben Stiller coming on. For, to promote uh, Mystery Men and do the thing with, uh, or was it Mystery Men he was promoting? It doesn't matter, but being like, the puppies! Yeah. yeah. Like, um, That's clearly, what's kind of goofy. Yeah, clearly no level of, like, understanding of what's going on or anything right. like that. Just a right. random thing. But, like, I don't know. I feel like this is the evolution of that in terms yeah. of making the product. Because, you know, you, you're not going to, and sometimes you get celebrity involvement and what have you, what a lot of times you do. Um, but I just see this as sort of like the next na- next natural evolution of like the of it as a character within the world. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's I think that's fine. I think that you can have you can have sponsorship and not have it be completely bonkers and not totally out of the realm of okay, this makes sense. Let's move on. Um, I just think it needs to be done well. Um, Slim Jim's a great a great brand to recognize their sort of place within the wrestling sphere, though, is kind of what I was trying to get at. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, not so much a good one. But Slim Jim recognizes its legacy because of Savage. Slim Jim's Halloween Havoc, we as fans accept it more, and so therefore it's a great piece of business. But you know what? If I'm looking back at, like, Mania, and I'm thinking, like, what other match could have been the Cinnamon Toast Crunch match? I mean, you could have done any other match, you know. But that's they, what it's what it is indicative of, though, is that their level of belief in Ray and Dominic. And so, if I'm if I exactly. work for them, exactly. if I work for them, I don't mm-hmm. care that I have a blood feud storyline going on. Yeah. I want to be one of the sponsored matches. Right. It just was goofy that the friggin' cinnamon toast crunch guy was standing on outside the ring while the two of them are going at it. You know what I mean? No, that's, I know. That's my only. That was my only problem. I mean. I forgot about that part, to be honest with you. Honestly, like if it if like I know that I know Prime is Logan Paul's thing, oh, but like genius. let's but like let's just say Prime was the sponsor of the of the Rey Mysterio Dominic Mysterio match. Like that would have been fine, you know. And then you could have done the six woman tag match could have been the cinnamon toast crunch match, you know, where it's like, but I understand what you're saying. It's, they want a marquee match. They want something that's going to be significant. I, I get it. And I can, I can appreciate that. Um, also, it uh, the, when the battle Royal become the sponsor of slim Jim is the most bill Watts booking like ever, by the oh, way. Absolutely. absolutely. It, it would have almost, it would have been up there with if the cinnamon toast crunch was on the money in the bank briefcase. When the, cinnamon, uh, when the Cinnamon Toast Crunch Money in the Bank briefcase. Now that you say it, though, I kind of want to see it because I want to see someone make it work. Right. Because that like, someone if, exists. If Big E won it, <laughs> you know, like Big E wins the friggin' bootios. Like, you know, I mean, you could have had it. I think it depends on who. I think it depends on the sponsorship and it depends on who's like what they're booking the match through. Because the Money in the Bank match is a marquee match. You know, I don't know if they're still in business, but is Western Union still a thing? Yeah, I think so. Okay, they should sponsor it because they also have deep WWF brand synergy opportunities. Western Union! Yeah. <laughs> a Castrol GTX? Yeah. Did they sponsor? Okay, we're, we're complete. John Lord, yeah. all this from John Lordnitis. John Lordnitis. Yeah. Am I up again still or is it you now? Um, I think it's up. To, I think it's me. Yeah, because I did Blacktop Bully and John Lawrence. Right, right, I do my ahead. five and six. All right, yep, number five, right. Big Al Big from WCW. Now, oh, okay. after after Big Al's devastating defeat in that legendary Skins match from Super Brawl 2000, you mean, are you familiar with Big Al versus Tank Ab in a Skins match? Yes. All right. After his loss, Big Al entered into a deep depression. However, after Beat accidentally mailed a residual check for the sales of the album, I'm still in love with you. <laughs> Al took the money and he forged a new life outside the Rosslyn business 
Uh, but when his match is named worst of all time by Dave Meltzer, Big Al enters the tournament to prove his detractors wrong and that no one can, quote, fucking kill you right now. Ah, uh, come on. His special, his special move is the beard shield. Uh, ever since that one time, Tony Schiavone was like, uh, Take Abbott's going to cut his beard. That <laughs> knife. <laughs> he doesn't even have a beard. For a minute when you were talking about Big Al, though, I thought you were talking about Al Wilson. Tori Wilson's dad. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a deep cut. <laughs> big Al will. Oh, yeah. Big up the Big Al Wilson. Wilson, cool. But thank God that wasn't it. I'm so glad. I, yeah, this I, prefer, is, I prefer this Big Al over that. This big is Al. Al Green, the guy that loses to uh Yeah. To a uh, fucking Tank Abbott. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And t- he's got the <laughs> he's got the knife. I mean, just in mm-hmm. case anyone out there doesn't know, he's got the knife and he holds it up to Big Al. He's like, oh, I could fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Man's like, geez, Tony, what's he, what's he doing? Um, I think I think he had some scissors, and he was going to cut his beard. Mark and he Madden. doesn't even have a beard. Mark Madden. God, that was such a bad freaking announcing team. <laughs> yeah, this is Mark Smoky Madden, Ghost Rider of Positively Canyon, Tony. <laughs> um, so he, he my, my big owl can grow a beard that yeah. acts as a shield for a few seconds. All right. I like that. <laughs> it can act as a shield. It could protect him from John Laurinaitis just boring the shit out of him to death. <laughs> I really want to see this game, by the way. Oh yeah. Oh, I feel like this is gonna be add-ons. This is gonna be this is they're gonna make this and they're gonna make this. Somebody's gonna make this. Alright, so I feel like number six is the one where people either turn this thing off or throw me mad respect. Okay, here we go. Alright, the number six is the in your house alien. Okay. Are you familiar with the commercial where the, the I told you they just had to be on TV and then they oh own Oh my them. god. Oh my god. Oh, okay, buckle up folks. The in your house alien. <laughs> Are you familiar with the in your house alien? I don't remember the in your house alien. But go ahead. So there was that commercial. I think it was for like uh international incident or beware of dog where the aliens would come down and, it was, and they would be like um abducting oh yeah life form oh my god i do remember this now learning in your house yes oh my cool. god how dare you okay john michaels oh, Matt johnson and the aliens would like watch it and be like in your house we're in your house tonight oh, i don't know what this is by the way that's a good that's a, that's like playing saxophone <laughs> that's the, that's what you're, i think you're I like doing. you're like you're like bill clinton playing the saxophone <laughs> And I mean the WWF Bill Clinton, the guy that they brought out at the pay-per-view that was like... Wow. Wow. Why is that not a character? Oh, oh, you got to look at this Sonny over here. <laughs> that was a terrible Bill Clinton. Did you but, watch the uh, the cl- American... The clit? <laughs> I didn't watch the clit. I did not watch the clit. <laughs> no, the... <laughs> I haven't. My brother watched it. My brother's like, you got to watch it. It's fantastic. I, the American Horror... Is American Horror Story or American... American Crime Story. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, everybody. He said it was. He, everybody said it was fantastic. I need to watch it. It's. It it's is, but the the dude that plays Clinton. Um. God, who Clinton. is it? <laughs> who is oh, the guy that plays? Oh shit! All right, that I gotta look up. Hold on, I'm gonna go to my. I'm gonna go is to it, my Google. Is it Rufus machine. Sewell? No, it's. No, it's not him. It's um. Hold on, don't. Hold it's on. someone very not American, which is fine. It's just an English actor, I believe. Just keep. Keep vamping, and I'll tell you in two seconds. It's someone that he has to like hide his accent on top of it. Is it Clive Owen? God damn it! God damn you! Um, Come on, Google. Um, but it's it's a great performance. But I I couldn't help but thinking that that had to be so hard for him to do that accent on top of masking his accent. Mm. Um, Jesus, my grandmother is slower than they're faster than this. It is Clive. It is Clive Owen. You're right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sarah Paulson played Linda Tripp. That's right. And uh, the girl that plays Monica Lewinsky does an amazing job, I thought. Yep. Beanie like just, Feldstein. Yeah, just Ooh. an amazing job. If anybody doesn't know who Beanie Feldstein is, um, she's actually in like the first season of What We Do in the Shadows. She plays the uh, the college girl that they transform into a vampire. And like, Where is she from? Do you know? Beanie Feldstein? Yeah. Um, I mean, she's American. She's probably. Oh, she's Amer- she's American. Yeah, she's an American actress. She's okay. actually she's really good too. I like her a lot, actually. Yeah, and I, I heard, did... I heard that she was really good as, 
as Monica Lewinsky. I gotta watch it. It's on my it's on my short list of like my short list is no longer a short list. It's a freaking ridiculously long oh, list. Oh yeah, but, it never ends. Yeah, it never ends. But uh, do you yeah. remember how we got here? Oh, I was playing the saxophone in the yeah, in your house the saxophone commercial. for the wow. in your house aliens. All right, so the in your house aliens is your number okay, six. So- in the summer of 96, the Keep aliens going. aliens from another world came to Earth and abducted various WWF fans in order to understand the phenomenon that was in your house. Uh, after gaining this knowledge, the aliens returned home only to learn that by the time they arrived, the television signals beamed into space were now showing WCW Nitro and the uh, NWO on their home planet. Learning that WWF was no longer cool, the aliens returned to Earth and arrived just in time for the Super Entertainment Brothers Tournament. Uh, their special move is the welcome to my house. They summon a replica in your house house and it explodes, dealing massive damage to all on-screen characters, including yourself. For a minute, I thought you were really explaining like what happened to the aliens in the commercial and that they went back and they were watching Monday Night Football. I was like, really? I'm like, that's kind of real edgy by the WWF. That's tremendous. No, dude, the commercial, they just abducted the kid and ate the popcorn. I know. And we were like, house. But it's just funny because I could picture like Vince going, oh, we're going to have him look at Nitro and realize that Nitro sucks, pal. It's good shit. Oh, yeah. What is, this, what is this garbage you're watching here, alien? I don't know why they like this. Just this random stupid marketing campaign. I don't yes. know why it resonates with me. Um, the, 96. The, the new generation, pal. Would that have been when probably Independence Day was probably in the theater? It would then it was international incident. They were advertising then. Yeah. Yeah, I fucking love it. Good poll. I should have watched King of the Ring '96 to see if any uh, commercials arrived on the network because I could not find the commercials on YouTube or anything like that. Mm. All right. Um, I came across that recently, like within the last like year or so. It was on some deep dive. I forget where. It could very well have been like a botchamania thing that he did. A, he added it in, but yeah, no, that's great. If I find any, I'll let you know. Yes. All right. Please do. So I have my number six and my number seven. That is correct. Number six. Oh, it's the Lord Alfred Hayes. In a startling twist of events, Lord Alfred Hayes appears to be this sweet, tea-drinking English gentleman. But once the fight starts, he sheds his three-piece suit and becomes a wild Tarzan-like animal. He swings wild haymakers and bursts your abdomen with spears and gut-wrenching suplexes. His final maneuver is a modified sleeper hold, where once you are out, he then goes to your house and performs an umpadecker in your home toilet. He then sits on your couch repairs his suit, puts it back on, grabs the microphone, and assists backstage with Mean Gene Oakland. What a roller coaster of a man. Can you say final maneuver again? Final, final maneuver. <laughs> his, his final maneuver. <laughs> and the reason why it's his final maneuver is because sometimes I refer to a bowel movement as a maneuver. <laughs> He performs, and you know what an upper decker is, don't you? No, no, I do, I do, I do. I'm just laughing. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everything you've said has been quite humorous, <laughs> absolutely. But if you wouldn't have said his final <laughs> maneuver, his final maneuver, I like the part that he sews his he sews his suit back up and then puts it on to go out and help Mean Gene. <laughs> so I can just picture Lord Al sitting there going, "I got to put this back on." I don't, I don't know why final maneuver. Just really triggers me. I'm glad. That's good. It's just like it's, it's so the way he would say it, though. His, like that's the thing. Is I also thought like at, you know your he would impression say, is great, but the fact that he would actually say it just makes it. Oh sure. And the then game. like he would say like he always would. What a roller coaster of a man. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I can picture Lord Al saying shit like that. You know, I can't handle it. I want Lord Al as a sentimental winner. Oh yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, the next opponent, my number seven, is Danny Davis, uh, referee turned scoundrel. Oh. Oh. Skill, what is this? What happened to this? You, can you hear this? It's a T minus. It sounds like it sounds like the aliens are coming. Couldn't have done it without you. That was fantastic. I live. It said it said they, but it was great because I heard T minus and I went, uh oh, the aliens are coming to get you. No, that the, was uh, uh, 
that was a uh, airplay share error in the old Johnny C household. Oh, nice. Well, that's good. Um, At least it wasn't Lord Alfred Hayes pornography. <laughs> that, that was the final maneuver of this podcast. That was podcast. the final maneuver of this podcast. Um, so re- referee turned scoundrel, dangerous Danny Davis is a man not to be trifled with. He knows all the cheap shots and tricks to fool any opponent. Jimmy Hart accompanies him to a matchup, and once the final moments arrive, he throws the megaphone in for help. But don't worry, though. There's a 75% chance you'll intercept it and be able to hit and knock out Danny. Because, well, let's face it, he's not that good. I like Danny Davis, the dangerous well, one. Danny Davis is from New Hampshire, which is why he's got that horrible, like, New Hampshire accent. That's I don't. Is he the only wrestler built from New Hampshire? I believe so, yes. Where was uh, Kevin, where's Mike Rotunda from? Oh, Syracuse? Um, I don't want to talk about Mike Rotunda. He is the worst parent of a professional wrestling. <laughs> Captain there was, Mike Rotunda. There was, there was actually, there was a point where they had at WrestleCon in Detroit. I didn't go, but Jake was there. Jake the Snake was there as well as IRS. He was going as IRS. And I wanted to go, and I hoped that they were sitting next to each other so that I could say to Mike Rotunda, you are the worst father in wrestling history, and I'm st- and I- and that includes that guy's dad in point at Jake <laughs> Roberts, just to have Jake go like, Jesus Christ, man, tell that about. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I do a fantastic Jake Roberts. Like, my Jake Roberts is current Jake the Snake. I mean, I, it's got to be Jake after he's done a lot of crack. You know, I don't do Jake WrestleMania six where he's talking about avarice. That and then I do the. Uh, why are you so nervous, my man? That's from WrestleMania 7 when he's talking to Alex Trebek. So. <laughs> Which Pete and I have a great conspiracy theory that Alex Trebek hired Earthquake to kill Damien. I can't after, even. After the freaking WrestleMania 7 thing when Damien scared the shit out of Alex Trebek. Because, you know, they're both Canadian. So. <laughs> and then he says, well, Damien. <laughs> well, Damien, I guess we'll have to, yeah, you want it? Well, Damien, I guess we'll have to settle for the home version of Jeopardy. <laughs> Tell you, man, the guy was my fucking bread and butter when I was a kid. I love Jake. But, now, but it's so great because <laughs> you got to look and go, why are you so nervous, my man? You Trust me, you're going to be at work on Monday. Trust gonna, me, you just said trust, 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 me. Say trust me. Trust me, you're going to be at work on Monday and somebody's going to come up to you and you're going to go, why are you so nervous, my man? Like that. <laughs> In that voice, too. Somebody's going to be like, Johnny, why did you change your voice? You're going to be like, I don't know, but it uh, sounds pretty good like this, doesn't it? I can't I can't handle this episode of Multiverse. <laughs> I, I, I've been triggered like 86 times. I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> I, I, I triggered. I triggered you. Are you okay? Do you need to go to therapy? Uh, well, I don't, I'm not sure how the kids use that word. But, you know, it's like uh, I just – no, this one just uh, – some random polls. I'm appreciating it. I'm so nervous, my man. All right, so moving on. <laughs> All right, so are we on to my last two? Your last two, yes. All right, number seven, you're going to be pissed. Uh, is it dangerous Danny Davis? <laughs> no. We haven't had any synergy crossovers, though. Oh, is it? Is it Mike Rotunda? <laughs> no, it's not Mike Rotunda. I feel like I've talked about this character before, and, and you were you uh, you disliked it. Number seven is... WWF Mania guest host Jason Taruskin. <laughs> All right. Now I'm telling you people. I don't think I've dis- when did I disagree with this or when did I have like a problem with it? What was we did a tournament. You love that guy. Well, I'll tell you. You know why I love this guy? <laughs> because tell I me, can't tell me Jim Cornette. You just went, <laughs> I'll tell you. Instead of just like James E there. <laughs> Because I can't, well, first of all, I can't find the goddamn episode. Where are the resources of the internet wrestling community? I need the WWF Mania episode uh, that's guest hosted by Jason Taruskin. Now, the reason this guy lives in infamy in my mind is I happen to watch the one episode of Mania that he guest hosted randomly someday. Yeah. And he he won like a send in a, send in a video, an audition. Like he watched it when it was like. Live, like, yes, happening. Okay, yes, right. when it happened, and I was like, Holy shit, this kid, you know, I was maybe like 15, 16 at the time. You know, I'm a little, I'm younger than that, and I'm like, He's really out there guest hosting. How cool would that be? Sure, and uh, 
him and Todd Pettengill, though, wear these uh, trench coat mafia coats. Yeah. Like, they're they're really, like, it's a really, like, strange and unique look for them. Okay. Uh, but this kid wrote in, and he did, like, an impression of the Hart family, which also got got over with me. Um, and then he, he sang Owen Hart's, uh, Bret Hart's theme song was like, vote for Jason, Jason, vote for Jason, Jason. <laughs> All right. Now, hey. And they voted for him. And they voted for him. Yeah. Um, my version was assaulted by Todd Pettengill, though, and locked in the DJ's basement. Mm. Years later, Jason Teruskin escapes with revenge on his mind. He sent in another videotape, this time making fun of Owen Hart to try and gain entry oh. into the tournament. However, unaware of how that video now plays. Yes. Because it's not 1994. Uh, he was disqualified from the competition. Mm. However, after Vince McMahon accidentally watched the tape, uh, he called up Jason Tereskin right away and personally invited him to compete in the tournament. Nice. Uh, his move is... I don't know if I want to tell that joke, though. He hits you with a guitar. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I'm going to leave that joke out. Why? No, I'm going to leave it out. Um, it's, not like you said you, it's not like you said he throws you off a rafter. I mean... <laughs> you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Wanna... Owen, I didn't mean to do that. Well, no, that's the thing. I wanted to make it clear that, like, uh, you know, that's the gag is that uh, he's like slap nuts. Yeah, exactly. That's good. I like it. Number eight Mm -hmm. and my final is the British Bulldog Kid. (laughs) He's going to win whether he likes it or not. Yes. (laughs) In the summer of 1992, one little boy or girl, Mm -hmm. as it's often debated, Yes. I was very excited to see the British Bulldog defeat Bret Hart for the Intercontinental title. This child yes. claimed that the British Bulldog would win, mm-hmm. whether he wanted to or not. Yep. Now, that night, uh, the child saw the, the Davy Boy Smith walking on the street mm-hmm. and approached him for an autograph. The British Bulldog, being high on crack at the time, yelled at the boy or girl about how bizarre he was and ran away. The child entered a comatose state that kept them from aging. They've wow. awakened in time for the uh, Super Entertainment Brothers tournament and are wow. ready to show the world how bizarre they are. And they vow to win the tournament, whether they want to or not. I like the bizarre because it kind of makes me think of the bizarre one gold does. Well, it is why the British Bulldogs going to win the Royal Rumble. Because I'm busy. That's right. Now, this kid's move is the hat toss. The British Bulldog kid throws their cool green British Bulldog hat at their enemy to do moderate damage. It's a hat green. I love it. Yes, it is. I love it. All right. Yeah, it's the, 90, it's the 90s. It's the 92 neon green WWF sign. Hat. So. I love it. <clears throat> that kid. I was so happy when I was listening to a podcast before I started doing this and heard people who appreciated appreciated little things like the British Bulldog Kid as much as that. Oh, did. yeah. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Those are the things that I think bring our community together is those yeah. weird things. I, I, yeah, so the British Bulldog Kid has a big place. In your heart. And, and they'd be the reason I'd get the DLC. Oh, wait. No, I already gave that to somebody. Who was that? I forget. It was really funny. Oh, well. Oh, of this of your group? No, of your it was one of yours. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I can't remember who though. That feels like for it feels like it was eight hours ago in yeah. my brain with how much I've was how it, much was oxygen the, I've lost. Was it the genius? Could it have been the genius? It could have been the <laughs> with genius. His, with his ma- his amazing poem. It could um, have been the genius. What was the thing he throws at the He throws his metal over? his metal scroll. What does he, he says, say though? Hickory dickory duck. Yes. I can suck my own. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, my number eight guy, uh, I hope this doesn't upset you. I don't get upset. It is King Hippo. <laughs> Crossing over from the Punch-Out world, from Punch-Out Brothers, was there ever a boxer turned, sport, turned sports entertainer like the King? Hippo wants to show the world he has the chops to eat his opponents up and spit most of them out. He wants to make sure the winner is not you, and he will do this by punching and kicking you with his big old ham hocks. Keep in mind, his weakness in punch out might still knock him out. And and Keith, that's what we're missing in the world. We need the WWE to purchase or license characters and bring them in and have actors portray them. Absolutely. Or it's the gimmick. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's an actual big boxer guy, and they call him the King Hippo. I really wanted to just put that in so that I could do the winner is not you, because I know you love the winner is you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, I felt that diss. I Good. felt that diss. <laughs> I just chose to no-sell it. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Hogan, for no-selling that. Thank you, Ultimate Warrior. So, did you watch Captain N, the Game Master, where King Hippo was an enemy? Of course. Okay, uh... uh That was like the tail end of my uh, cartoon watching days, but I still watched it. Yes. God, Captain and the Game Game Master. What what a what a friend. Mega Man. You know. Did they also have? Wait, correct me if I'm wrong. Was Little Nemo a character on that? Or yes, that he, had a, his, he had his he had his own episode. He had his own episode. Did he have his own? He didn't have well, his own show, though, right? No. Oh boy, there was a movie. I'm sorry, I'm off camera. I'm just trying oh, to. Fair. I was trying to plug in my laptop because it's dying on me. No, there was a there was a movie. Um, there was a there Captain was a little, Nemo, the Dream Master movie. There was a Little Nemo in Dreamland movie okay. that came out in the early '90s, but there was a Dream, uh, Little Nemo episode of. Yeah. Yeah, a themed okay. episode of Captain I thought Man. I thought so because I was I was like I used to love that game Little Nemo the Dream Master. Okay. I loved that game by Nintendo, so. That was a friggin' baller of a cartoon I might add. The was uh, it? the Nintendo the one what was it called again? You just said it. It was a uh, Captain and the Game Master. Yeah. That was a great cartoon. Yeah. Um I I will never forget that that show made me get the Adventures of Bayou Billy for the Nintendo. Oh, yeah? Did you ever play that game? No, I didn't. That is like a Burt Reynolds movie come to life. From the 70s. Like, it's, 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 I mean, it's insanely difficult. Yeah. <laughs> what the, wait, uh, Bayou Billy, The Adventures of Bayou Billy. That game was ridiculously difficult. And now I want to end this episode with the theme music for that. All right, we'll do it. All right, so speaking of ending the episode... That is all eight characters. Now, Keith, we we need we cannot settle this battle in the real world because these characters do not exist. However, we can enter all these characters into a random tournament and do some yes. high low card and see who wins. All right, I love it. Let's do I, it. I've got a bracket. So shuffle okay. your deck. We do have cards, ladies and gentlemen. I can prove that it is indeed a real deck. All right. My deck is shuffled. Of course, if I were to use a trick deck on the my own podcast show, I'd be a pretty big loser. Nah, you'd probably be just you'd be, listen. Let's put it this way: you'd be just like any other uh, professional wrestling promoter. So. Mm, well, did I change the deck off camera? I don't know. All right, so it's all round, jokers. <laughs> round one is George and Adam versus Frenchie Martin. Now we we need a, a special. I'm just gonna take the top card and. Yeah, that's what I'll all do. Right. All right. Uh, we need some sort of. Uh, here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. You want to do one, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. King. All right, so you have a king. Uh, Frenchie okay. Martin wins. Okay. Because that's your guy. Yep. George and Adam, see you later. All right. All right. Um, Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase with the WF title versus Vivian Rosado. Rosado, yep. All right. This is a match like none other. One, two, three, shoot. Oh! oh it's a nine how about eight. that? It's oh, that's awesome! Eight. Nice. It's a million dollar man, my yes, god. Yes, it is, my god. Or the, we're just squeaking out a victory there, Jim. <laughs> I want to have that tape reviewed, Monsoon. Hey, real quick on tape reviewed, I really thought about doing WWF's George Steinbrenner from the Instant Replay debate as a character, but I felt like I talked about that too much. I'm uh, regretting the Jason Taruskin poll now and should have used George Steinbrenner. That's a great one, though. That George Steinbrenner. I. Because he really does kind of sound like Larry David in that. So, yeah. Inconclusive. Inconclusive, my eye. Inconclusive, my eye. Who are these two? I'll have them on the streets by sundown. All right. Uh, Reed Flair taking on the genius. This is a Uh-oh. fucking insane matchup, by the way. Okay. All right. So you got to represent for yours. It's ace high or low? Low? Ace is high in this ace game. Is high. Okay. It's a All visual right. medium. So, yeah, the ace has got to be a big winner. All right. All right. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Uh, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I haven't changed it up each time. Oh, oh no! 10 <laughs> versus 10! Oh, all right. What do we do? What do we do? Draw. Are you ready? Should we do like some sort of... Okay, we'll just redraw. All right. Three, two, one, shoot. Eight versus... Oh, I've got eight. Uh, Keith uh, has nine. God, uh, the this genius is, one. This is the most riveting uh, drawing of cards in the history of our sport, by the way. I feel like this is our kennel from hell, but I kind of love it. My sport. All right. All right, uh, Francois Petit taking on the Blacktop Bully. 
Okay, ready? Three, two, one, shoot. Oh, the ace! Ace wins. The ace! But Dr. you know Francois. what? That's what I hate. I pulled an ace. Keithy pulled a three. Why do I pull an ace when he pulls a three? That seems like an unfair balancing. Oh, that's okay. It's all right. I had a king, and you pulled a two in the first matchup, so. Oh, yeah. So Wow, right. what I love is that we've each had a person win mm -hmm. in the bracket. Yep. All right, so Big Al, I will can kill you versus John Laurinaitis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please, I, people power. All right, one, two, three, shoot. What is this? What do ace. I have? I have an ace of diamonds. All right, so ace wins four. Okay. My camera is murdering these cards. So by Big the Al. Way. So Big Al defeats that. I feel like that's a heartbreaker because I feel like we laugh more with Laurinaitis. That's all right. We laugh with Big Al. All right. Oh, God. I don't know. I, Keith, I don't know who I want to win this match. This next match is impossible for me. It's the In Your House Alien, my deepest pull, versus Lord Al, the one that just sent Al. me off the rails. Here with we the go! With the, with the final, don't final maneuver! Let's see what the final maneuver here is for Lord Al. Are you ready? All right, Three, here we two, go. One, shoot! Oh! Another tie! Here we go. Double fours. Unbelievable! Ready? ready? Unbelievable. Three... Two, one, final maneuver, shoot! Oh, and Lord Alfred Hayes takes this victory over the In Your House alien. This is a king is seven or something like that? That was too much. That was too much. I shouldn't be laughing this hard at I this love nonsense. these ties. These ties are fantastic. They're adding All right, so stuff. we each had one from there as well. Okay, good. Wow. Jason Taruskin versus Dangerous Danny Davis. Okay. Three. <laughs> Two, one, shoot. Well, I got a jack for Jason, and he goes down to an ace? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, boy. Dangerous ad. Uh, dangerous Danny Davis. See, the good thing, though, is that Dangerous Danny Davis is bound to lose because right. he sucks. <laughs> Unbelievable, which means Taruskin must really suck. Yeah. I love the cosmic balancing. So, Big uh, British Bulldog Kid versus King Hippo. If the universe has a sense of humor, British Bulldog Kid will win. All right. Three, two, one, shoot. Oh, the jack for Jason Taruskin! You and win. It beats the nine. I love it. Right. The brand synergy of fate. Okay, good. All right, so now we're at round two. Elite eight. We got Frenchie Martin taking on the main, which I just love it because we each have a representative versus okay. a million dollar man champion with okay. a belt. Three, two, one, shoot. I got a three. You got a I five. I got a five. Nice. So Frenchie Martin making it to the final four. Je me fais pompé. I died in Weekend at Bernie's. Wow. <laughs> We've got the genius versus Francois Petit. What if oh. we have a French final four? Oh, no. Unbelievable. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, shoot. I got a four for Petit. No! It's oh, I got a oh, no! Yes! yes! The genius, the the genius, genius lives! <laughs> Hickory dickory dock. I get to be in the final four. Oh, man, I love it. So that that's your bracket. You've claimed it mm -hmm. both. All right, so um, Big Al taking on Lord at the Battle of the Owls. Are you fucking kidding me? Battle of the Owls. The Battle of the Owls. <laughs> this is the dumbest thing in the history of our sport, and I love it. All right, three, two, one, shoot. Oh, the king! Uh, the king defeats the Lord! The Lord is dead! Long live the king! <laughs> The Lord is dead. Long live the king. Lord Alfred Hayes has had his final maneuver. <laughs> I fucking can't. Uh, all right, Johnny. <laughs> so I'm pulling for freaking, I'm pulling for the British Bulldog kid right now. <laughs> all right, British Bulldog kid taking on dangerous Danny Davis. You ready? Three, two, one, shoot. Oh, it's a five. Oh, <laughs> No! The British Bulldog Kid is one, whether you want to or not. <laughs> What's so great about this is that the five is so indicative of the British Bulldog Kid, and the two is so indicative of Dangerous Danny oh, Davis. I love it. That means that in the first matchup, Danny Davis had the 25% chance that he did that he did not, that he caught the megaphone. And in this one, the British Bulldog Kid won, whether you want to or not. He, so, so the British Bulldog Kid had the 75% chance that he caught the megaphone. All right, so here we go. Here we go. Here we go. We're in a unique position because you have one side of the bracket and I have one. So yeah. it's your choice, Frenchie Martin 
versus the genius, who do you want to pull for? They're both your characters. Um, it's your finals in a way. I'm going to pull for the genius. Okay, then I'm pulling for Frenchie Martin. All right. You All ready? Right. Yes, sir. Three, two, two one. one, shoot. Oh, it's oh! a five. Oh, no. The genius is gone. The genius is lost. It's Frenchie Martin. Uh, Frenchie Martin. Oh, shit. Okay. All right. So um, one of the favorites of the tournament is lost. Is lo- didn't you say you wanted the genius to win? <laughs> All right. All so, right. So you tell me, is it big? Is it King Al, Big Al, or is it the British? Who do you want? I want the British Bulldog kid to win. All right. Whether he wants, wait, that's it. That's how we settle this. It could only be uh, the British Bulldog kid winning because he wins whether he wants to or not. I feel like that's the only way this can end. The tournament needs to be decided, though. We have okay. to hold the rules of this of this of this game. Since okay. I'm pulling for the kid, I'll pull for him in real life. All right, you ready? Three, two, one, shoot! He gets an ace. He gets an ace. <laughs> Unbelievable! All right, I just so like. The, so the final is. Do you want to do a quick break and talk about their their journeys to the finals? Well, I <laughs> or mean, do you need time. <laughs> I, I think just a moment to appreciate this, mm. like one, one illegitimate man, mm. but also it completely. Here's the thing: the British Bulldog kid, I think, is more real than Frenchie Martin, even though Frenchie Martin was on TV. Sure. Because this kid was a real person. Yes. And Frenchie Martin is a fictional person. Yes. And I just love that they're here interacting on a field of warfare. Absolutely. On the on the field of battle. So and I love that we each have a side in and um, this is it. This is for all, all the right. marbles. Now, do we do we shuffle? No. OK. No, no, no. I didn't shuffle since the first. No, I didn't either. Was... Well, just because it was the finals. Yeah, but no, there's no no. We're not fixing anything. We're not we're not kayfabing this. This is a true testament all right. of strength here. Three, two, one. Pull. <laughs> what you've seen, what you see, ladies and gentlemen, is Keithy pulled a two and, and I pulled a four. A four being a terrible pull, which means the British Bulldog kid won whether he wanted to or not. Because the universe made Keithy pull a two and I only pulled a four. The f- multiverse of fabulousness. Amazing. As always. And I love, hey, I love Frenchie Martin, but I feel like the gimmick of the British Bulldog kid winning yep. is just, I mean. There's too much brand synergy here, pal. So the winner of the first ever uh, Super Entertainment Brothers Tournament of Champions from is the Bulls is the, the winner is you. <laughs> I cannot believe this kid. I, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe he won. Whether he, I'm just he won. Is it a, is it a, is it a he or is it a she? I mean, it doesn't really matter. But I believe, like, actually, I believe Peter and I found out it is a she. Somebody did go through and do the research and found out it is a girl. Hey, that's great. And and I, if I if I said she yeah, won, whether she won it yeah. or not, yeah, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, that makes me love it even more. <laughs> you know, because I think of I think of I think of a lot of girls being fans now, which is awesome. And yeah. you know, because my bubble was so small. Sure. I'm just limiting it to my personal experience. Nope. It's she just, won. It's cool. It's fantastic. I am very happy with that tournament final. I am very happy with the way that that panned out. I think it was uh, amazing that fate and happenstance made it so that we each had people to represent us, and it worked out perfectly. So you know, I wasn't sure about the card gimmick, man, but just because I didn't have, but having Lord Alfred Hayes lose to the kid, like there was that tournament told a story that I wasn't sure. prepared to tell. Nope, and it was an amazing story altogether. All right, so aren't uh, you glad we did this? Oh, absolutely. It just, it, you know, I, I, I cannot believe the universe agreed. Sure. Fantastic. Well, we found uh, the perfect multiverse today. Absolutely. I feel it, like we need to revisit this, like, sooner or later. It, it, well, I tell you, I feel like it had a little something for everybody this go around. <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, we t- do you remember talking about Clinton? I, I remember you said the word clit. <laughs> yes, yes. That was a, that was a, that was that was accidentally unintended. I know. Yes. No, but it was, uh, yes, that was a very good, uh, yeah, we talked about Bill Clinton. We talked about you playing the saxophone with the aliens. It was, uh, we, that's how we, 
Yeah. We went on a journey, and the journey was fantastic. So. Yeah, I mean, how many different Earths did we visit because we referenced so many things? Yes. We went so, on, what is a journey into mystery? We went into a journey into mystery. That's right. That's right. And uh, is there anything you want to promote before we move out of this bad boy? Um, well, I mean, you know that you can catch me on Alicot with Keithy. Uh, the most recent episode would have dropped uh, probably when this aired. <laughs> There'll be an episode dropping, so yes. check that out. And, uh, of course, you can hear me on Greetings from Allentown, GFA Live, with my friend Petey. And, um, of course, I'm on Multiverse of Fabulousness. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great time to check out anything on the North-South Connection and any other private feeds that may be uh, the new TNN or whatever, what have you. So, you know. Absolutely. I got to tell you, over at the new TNN, mm -hmm. uh, we just did our 200th episode. Wow. And when I say our, uh, you know, it's just me and the and the voices, the impressions. Well, um, it, what, what man was it this, uh, the 200th episode? What was it? It was Junk Man. Okay. Because we, we wanted to do a bad movie. Okay. Because every 50, we celebrate with a bad movie. Well, we celebrate with a movie discussion. With 50 was Transformers the movie from 86, which is not a bad movie. It was a respect bow down to that movie. Sure. Absolutely. For episode 100, we did Rollerball with Chris Klein, where he's like, Rollerball. That movie's garbage. So yes. yes. Uh, for 150, we did The Passion. Oh, okay. The movie doesn't make any sense. Wait, the Pat. All right, not the Passion of the Christ. Passion of the Christ. No, oh, but you the did Mel do Gibson. The the, the, oh, yeah, okay. the Mel Gibson right. film. Uh, we, what we did huh. was we watched it objectively. Okay. Meaning the movie has no plot. The movie expects that you have read the sure. prequel. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> read the prequel. <laughs> now, now, Keith, I'm serious here. Oh my god, that is fantastic! Oh my god, I am going to use that. I am totally going to steal 100. I am stealing that that phrase. You read the yeah. prequel, meaning the Bible. I fucking love that, John. As that a piece, fantastic. as a piece of standalone art, mm -hmm. it, it's not. It's it's. It tells a story without explaining itself. I was told that is a movie, one of those movies that you can only watch once. Yeah, because it sucks. Well, no, because it's also extremely like just violent and. Nah. You know, I mean, not you, more, not more so than. Did you anything watch? Else. But did you watch it with? I'm assuming you watched it with the subtitles on, right? I don't believe you speak Aramaic, right? Um. Yeah. Is there an unsubtitled version? I mean, I can't imagine because I don't believe anybody speaks Aramaic nowadays. Well, uh, doesn't that dude? Uh... Jim Caviezel? Well, they spoke it in the movie, yeah, but nobody nobody actually speaks it. It's not like, you know, like, if it's Italian, like, some Italian people might, you know. That guy's pretty weird, huh? Um, He is. He did kind of come out as pretty weird after that movie came out, I believe. I just, I, 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 and, 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 I, and, I, and I don't say this, like, I objectively watched it just as a movie. Sure. Like, I, turning... I, mean, I don't think it was a bad movie, right? It's just. Well, turning it's that disturbing. part, turning the part, turning the part of my brain off. Yeah. That understands what it is that I'm supposedly watching. Yeah. As a film, it has no real story to tell. All the information, all the emotion it wants you to feel and everything like that is implied to the viewer mm. without actually explaining itself. Okay. So as a film, mm -hmm. I don't think it is worth a goddamn. See what it is there? I, I see what you did there. Um, okay, I'd agree. I've never seen it. Um, I went to I went to well, what we call CCD, with this, which is just Catholic education. It's not Catholic school, but it's a like Catholic church school. And uh, so I was confirmed. I was raised a Catholic. I've read that book a few times, um, the prequel, so to speak. And I didn't need to see it. I didn't need to see it because I know the whole story. And um, I even taught CCD for two years. So no I even kidding. taught, yeah, I even taught kids about that story. So I didn't need to see it. And uh, we'll just leave it at that. But um, wow. And what was the hundred? What was the one fifty? episode that's what we did and then episode 200 was a uh, battleship that just came out oh wait 100 was rollerball that's right so 150 was oh and you just did battleship yes because because action figures or you know toys as cinematic franchises are back so battleship could have been the thing that's that kicked this whole thing off well, i'm waiting for i'm waiting for the reboot of clue 
Oh man. Which they keep talking about. And I keep hearing like, I keep hearing various directors. Uh, I've heard Adam McKay. I've heard, um, who was the guy that did, uh, all like knocked up and, um, so, um, Jed Apatow, Jed Apatow. And then I heard the kid that the guy that did, uh, wedding crashers and, uh, well, that might have been Judd Apatow, but the one that who did um, old school, the younger, he did the, uh, I think the Hangover movies. Oh, uh, and Joker. Todd, Joker yeah, Todd guy. Phillips. Todd, Todd Phillips, Phillips. Yeah. So I've heard like those guys, which mm-hmm. I think Adam McKay. I think any one of those three would be great because you know who they'd end up casting. You know, they'd end up casting like probably Vince Vaughn, Will Ferrell, that whole group, or even just um, I'd be okay with that. Uh-huh. He would never do it. But, you know, you had Greta Gerwig do Barbie, right? Sure. And I thought that was a pretty in, uh, intelligent film. What if you get, like, Wes Anderson to do Clue? He w- I, yeah. don't think he would ever, I don't think he would ever do it. Don't get it me would, wrong. It would, it, that's actually a very Wes Anderson, like, I feel like a very Wes Anderson material type material. Right. Um, I mean, I could see somebody like Tim Burton doing it and having it be very mm-hmm. Tim Burton-esque. But you know, uh, but you know I who I, you know who I would love to see do it is like a a real serious director like like Clint Eastwood or like Spielberg. Mm, sp- uh, Nolan's you know, Clue. Give me yeah, Nolan's. Give me Robert Zemeckis doing it. Robert Zemeckis have Danny Elfman do the music or Alan Silvestri do the music. Um, the problem is is that I love that movie. In fact, I got it here. And it's in my, well, I got shit in front of my DVD. Well, there are so many different ways to interpret Clue. That's what I, I, I love this discussion because I, you know, there are so many different approaches and I think a lot of them would work. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost too bad. They couldn't do like a, what if they did like a, a show on a streaming service where HBO's Clue, where yeah. each episode's an hour and it tells the story, but a different director does it uh, and sure. has a different killer. Sure. I'd be on board. I, would I think we just described the most expensive TV show in his. Well, no, no. I mean, an, I'm, uh, hardest to book show. Yeah, but I think that it would be fun, and you just do enough to have what the six main characters. So you're only doing a six episode. You know, does every director have to use the same cast? Oh, I think you have to. You think so? Yeah, to keep, yeah, because in my mind, in my mind, you have six episodes. Six directors. Each director basically pulls out of the hat who's going to be the vi- who's going to be the murderer, God and then damn. and then you have the seventh is like a collaborative work. This is yes. This, this is where the comic book mind comes into play. Where each because, where each director uh, writes their own version of the character, and maybe they get a seventh director, and he and that's the final, the real final episode. See, but, you know, but th- this is kind of like how comic books work, like where they have the bullpen. Right. And you have like you have like certain writers that are contributing and then they have the one overall arc. Right. And that's what they're writing towards. So it could be done because, I mean, shit, they did it with the MCU, you know. Right. They did it successfully with the MCU. I know you're a big fan of the DCEU or at least oh. parts of it. <laughs> no. Yeah, for sure. No, no, no. I, I, no, I don't take that shit personally. No, 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 no. No, the MCU did do it. Dude, I got sucked in. I mean, come on. As long as we don't have Jeff Johns anywhere near this, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, see, I don't know. I had to throw a dig at Jeff Johns. <laughs> I see. And this is like, I get it. I'm actually a huge fan of Johns' writing, though. I know. Like a oh, big. But, 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 I know, but when they made him like the overall like point person for comp. DC oh comp, no! It, it, no! No! It that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that shit didn't work. I just, yeah. it you know, like the lantern stuff is too fucking good. Yeah. No, you no, know, I that, like Jeff that concept. I like um, Doomsday Clock played well with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was what I it was a story I really gravitated towards as a as a meta thing about Superman. Yep. Mm-hmm. And an intelligent look at our modern world, I felt like, with the metahuman thesis. Sure. Um, if, if anyone out there has, it, you know, it was just the right amount of like, oh, and to mix with Watchmen. This is a completely different podcast. <laughs> but it's still riveting content, so. It is. It is. Listen, okay. That's what we do on the multiverse of fabulousness, but thank and you. I John. really want to watch this Clue show. I know. Well, let's see if we can make it happen. Let's see if we can put it out in the ether and make it happen. 
Oh God, does that should our we've never done this before? Mm-hmm. Should our next episode should we have to ca- do something with Clue, like cast Clue characters as wrestlers? You know, we've talked about we've talked about doing something with uh, was it Suburban Commando? I mean, I think this is perfect. I think the next episode of Multiverse of Fabulousness is we recast. Do you want to do directors too? Ooh, oh yeah, how deep, yeah. Wait, how deep do you want to get this? Do you want to get okay? How about we how about we figure out offline, obviously, you and I take three characters each, three directors each, and that per that director is responsible for writing the character and how they would guide that character in the movie. And then then together, maybe you and I should like try to write the seventh episode where we combine and we find out who really killed Mr. Body. We should do uh, Mr. McMahon. Ooh, you want to do the WWE version of Clue, where it's like we pick six directors and six WWE superstars that could represent each character. So, like, the big show is Professor Plum. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll do we'll do it by director. We'll do like four. We'll, we'll each pick four directors and then give us their vision of a WWF version right. of Clue. All right, we're gonna have to talk about this offline. Yeah. But yeah, is, we will. This will be a great September episode of Multiverse of Fabulousness. Yeah, because September is such a time where you feel like wrestling doesn't have a clue because yeah. it's the September pay per view <laughs> they're looking towards. <laughs> so cool. we'll figure something out. All right, All right listen great. to everything on NoSo and TNN yes. and Thank Greetings you. from Allentown, GFA Thank and Alucard with Keithy. Thank you. Um, he's Keithy Langston. I'm Johnny C. And a winner is you. <laughs>